welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. Whew, this has been quite the week. It's been nonprofit power week with your part-time controller. And I have to witness to you, Deanna Peterson, you know, your part-time controller was one of our very, very first sponsors because Eric Freint, your founder, uh, we were interviewing him and he was like, how do I get my logo on that screen? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and from there, it started like a whole journey for us. So I don't tell that story very often, but it's really, um, as we wrap up this week, I wanted to make sure that I did uh, call him out because he really did put us on a path. And now five years in, 1,200 episodes, um, we're here in large part due to your part-time controller. That is so awesome. I love hearing that story because it, it's so true. I can just see him saying it just right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit, because but we got to get going. Um, you know, we're based in Phoenix. He came here in this like beautiful three piece wool suit, had the of belt. Of course he did. <laughs> and it was like, I swear to you, I am not joking. I think it was like 117 that day. And I was like, oh, Mr. Frank, Mr. Frank, we don't dress like that here. Take off, you know, take off your vest, take off your suit jacket. And he was like, no, absolutely not. You know, I was so frantic that he was going to like, you know, become overwhelmed right. by the heat. Right. <laughs> He was, he was a trooper. But more importantly, my friend, Deanna Peterson, director of your part-time controller, um, you're in the hot seat today after a week of a lot of excitement, a lot of in, um, incredible thought leadership from your team and your team members. We're going to ask questions that have come in that we've had, that viewers have had, and we're going to get some of your answers. How, are you ready for it? I think so. I have not seen these questions ahead of time, so we will see how we go. I think I think it'll be great, actually. And I know that our team has just really appreciated and loved being on the show this week. So, Well, you know, I always tell folks when they are going to come on the show that you know this stuff, right? And, and, and I think especially you, uh, Deanna, I've worked with you. I've, you know, been um, engaged with you in our community. Um, you are based here in the Valley. Um, and so it's something that I think you're like the perfect person to get involved with. Another thing that's perfect about where we are with the, the nonprofit show are our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. Okay, we have these amazing co-hosts. You've been able to meet them over the last couple months. And I want to make sure that I call them out and thank them because they are truly amazing. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, flying today solo um, as we throw Deanna Peterson in front of these really awesome questions. So Deanna Peterson as a director of your part-time controller. Tell us what it is that you do before we launch you into these questions. So as a direct, so I'm the director for our Phoenix, Arizona, and New Mexico market. So okay. basically I meet a lot of nonprofits. I talk to a lot of nonprofit leaders and I help our staff, you know, provide the best service that we can for our, our clients. And our clients range from all sorts of nonprofits, small, large, any different type of nonprofit or foundation. You know, so we work with grantees and grantors, right? Um, and we... We just dive in. We're not afraid of a mess. We clean things up. And so as my role, I help support our team in diving into that mess, cleaning it up. And then I also help, you know, just talk to lots of different nonprofit leaders to see how we can support them. I love it. You know, um, one of the things I always think about the YPTC group, um, and, and this is really maybe a bizarre thing to say, but I feel like for the most part, you all are never going to run from the room with your hair on fire. You're going to be like, okay, well, let's think about that. <laughs> you know, you're very precise and you're very exact, but you never shame somebody for not knowing the answer. It's well, and that's the truth. Right, because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so 
bring someone in that's an expert, no one wants to hear, oh, you should have known this, which no, not necessarily. Let's just dive in, talk about it, and let's fix it going forward. You know, we'll give some advice. These are our recommendations, and we'll dive right in with the organization. So a lot of consultants will come in and tell people what to do, tell a team what to do, and then kind of say, okay, you can go do it. But we don't stop there. We implement it. We're right there in the thick of it with our clients, which is fun. I love it. Well, maybe that's why you all are so calm. Um, and that's really saying something because over the years, you know, we've had a lot of different of your team members on and talking about all manner of things. I mean, there's just so much to talk about. Um, and, and it's been fun to, to know that I can show up and do a show with you all and not feel like they're going to be like, oh my God, she's a dope. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> but let's get into some of our questions because there's some doozies here. And I really, um, I think after this week, it's really an exciting time to, you know, learn about what you all think and, and kind of to, to, to um, I don't know, put it in a different perspective because these are the things that we think about when we're looking at, um, accounting and finance. And, and before we ask the question, you know, I think there's a lot of fear to ask questions because so many times we think, oh, we're, we're the experts or we know what's going on, but um, we don't. And then we have to ask a question and we're afraid uh, to look foolish. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Well, let's get our first question up. Um, our nonprofit is going to see the CFO retire in Q2 of 2025, which is right around the corner. <laughs> we are wondering if we should move to a contracted leadership role that is remote serviced. It is somewhat frightening for our C-suite to think about us not having a CFO on site. Can you help us determine if the, adva the advantages and the disadvantages of this? Yeah, we... This is exactly with some of the questions, right? That our potential clients come to us and we talk about all the time. So the answer is it depends. The answer to everything is it <laughs> depends, obviously, but it depends on the size of the organization, right? Are we talking about a um, you know, 10 plus million dollar nonprofit organization? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about a you know, one to $5 million organization, or are we talking about a small organization, right? So depending on the size, mm -hmm. depending on the, um, you know, the life cycle stage as well of the organization, you might need that in-person full-time CFO, or you might not. Mm -hmm. So what we like to do is kind of just dive in and think about and talk about the specifics of this organization, the sizes, what are they expecting from a CFO? Do they need someone right by their beck and side every yeah. single minute of the week? Is that their management style? Or are they good with a weekly touch point and then the CFO that really just kind of dives in and gets things done and works with whatever team is in place that's you know doing the accounting and stuff? So depending yeah. on that cadence, we'll, de we'll decide what the organization needs. And I know that we work with nonprofits where we are that CFO, that fractional CFO, because mm -hmm. they feel good about having a couple of touch points throughout the week and then letting us work with their team. But we also work with organizations that are really pretty big and they do need that full-time CFO. Right. And what we do is we augment. So there is a time when you need a, a full-time CFO, but it's not all the time, right? Do you need high level CFO level work 40 hours a week or more? Or is that level of work just maybe 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, and the rest could maybe be a lower level employee that could do some of those other tasks? So I love that you brought up the fractional issue because I was thinking with this question, it's like, holy moly, it's all or nothing, right? And I love that you're talking about that fractional nature also because I know we've talked with some of your other leadership um, <clears throat> off camera, socially, um, Gerilyn Dressler, I had this conversation with her in Boston 
not six months ago about the lack of new talent coming in in terms of CPAs mm -hmm. and the real fear throughout the sector um, of not having, you know, cultivated enough college students and CPAs and all this. So fractional might be actually easier to find, right? I mean, it might be a strategy that's that's more logical. Right, exactly. And again, it depends on the size of the organization, but a lot mm -hmm. of times the CFO level work, if you look at it, it's only maybe half the week or a day a week that only a CPA can do that. Only a CFO level employee can do that versus the other tasks on the person's plate. So it's all about kind of looking at the responsibilities, looking at what you need out of this person, this partner, this thought partner, right? Versus, you know, just having an FTE or a full-time equivalent employee. Really interesting. Uh, you know, this is a, a new a new way to look at things. Um, and, and if you and I had had this conversation five, 10 years ago, this would have never been anything that we would have even thought about really. I mean, um, it would have been super innovative as opposed to a best practice. So, um, well, I would say you've done really well for the first question. All right, give me the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I love your attitude. Okay, our next question comes up. With an offsite bookkeeping service, how can we make the process more secure? Wow, this is a good question. It seems that someone working digitally and off campus has more opportunity to commit fraud. What do you think about that? Is that true or is that just an opinion? Well, so along with right the digital age and all of the different technologies out there have come a lot of advances when it comes to financial technology as well and software and helps to make sure that your segregation of duties are happening, your approval flow is happening properly, your, you know, all of all of the grant documentation that you need to have and the allocations, everything can be allocated properly if you utilize the system. So I always like to say, let's help, let's let our software like work for us, right? We're not going to work harder. We're going to work smarter. So some of the ways we do that in a remote environment, now we're not always remote. Sometimes we go on to our clients' uh, sites and we meet with them in person as well. But when we are working remote, we like to utilize things like bill.com okay. or ramp, different accounts payable process, electronic processing systems where you set up with the client, right? So you're meeting with the board or executive director and you're trying to figure out who needs to approve which expenses that go through. You set this up so that when an expense comes in, it can get coded and it goes through an already approved approval flow. This helps with the audit. I know earlier this week you were talking about how to make audits smoother and yes. faster, I believe. And so part of that is to automate and systemize your different processes. So that's one of the pieces that you can make actually more secure in a digital world. Right. And the side effect of that is that it takes less time because you're not entering things, you know, um, manually, you're not touching the paper, you're not touching the checks, right? So some of the question would be, okay, how do you get checks into the bank? Nonprofits are still getting checks from people yeah from foundations, yeah. from the government, sometimes they're still getting checks. Yeah, good and point. And recommend talking to your bank and setting up a lockbox. Then those checks go directly to the lockbox, the bank processes it, gets into your bank account, and then you're just working on recording things and you don't have to worry about the custody, somebody in person holding the check and stamping the check and taking it in, right? So um, a lot of that actually increases security as well because it's going directly to the bank or trying to process things more electronically too with ACHs or whatever else. Mm -hmm. But I do know nonprofits still like their checks. You know, I had not thought of that and I love that you brought that up because, you know, right now we're moving in to that Q4 super intense period of time mm -hmm. where we have a lot of events, we have a lot of you know, donor oriented events where people bring checks or they write down, you know, they fill out an envelope or, uh, you know, something of that nature. And then we have all of this, 
this financial information all the way through to checks, credit card information, all of that. So I love that you brought this up because that is, um, that's really something that we're all starting to encounter. And this is the time to, to put these um, safeties in place, right? Before it's too late and we have to wait a whole nother cycle. Right, exactly. You know, we're actually seeing more fraud, more issues with security when you have those paper items, as opposed to when you're doing it electronically through secure and, um, you know, tried and true type software. Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't recommend just jumping to any software possible, but a lot of these software um, options are SOC 2 compliant, which means they have gone through a rigorous um, information and testing to make sure that they're secure in their encryptions and everything else that they do. So I'm not an expert on that, but I do know that it takes a lot to become uh, compliant with all of these different regulations. So when you're using a software that already does that, it takes away some of that responsibility, that liability from the nonprofit, because you're no longer holding that envelope that has someone's credit card and their CCV and their you know, expiration date. And now you're trying to figure out what do I do with this after right. I logged it into the system. And, you know, that's more of a liability than doing it electronically. Wow. Okay. Well, wow. Sister two for two you <laughs> converted me. And uh, yeah, that's great. And you brought up some things I hadn't thought about. And, um, you know, just out the gate, this sense of that as we're doing things more digitally, we are protecting our donors and our staff right? And our staff, uh, you know, from, from being, um, I don't know, for being compromised, vulnerable. right? Yeah. yeah your information would get compromised and we don't want to be the, the, I mean, I know target even has had to send out that email, right. Or that letter that says, mm -hmm. you know, different big organizations have had to send that communication. No nonprofit wants to be that organization right that has to send out that communication saying i'm sorry your information has been compromised so the safer we the secure more secure we can be with our donors information the better overall yeah absolutely and yeah because true uh i have received those letters and it's just awful i can't imagine having to send that letter so okay well let's go into our third question um again two for two all right. Will our nonprofit save money or spend more money on having a remote financial team? It seems that we will save on office space, at least the area where two or three people would work. We will also eliminate benefit, benefit costs to manage. But from there, we're not sure about the other cost savings that should be considered. It's, it's a good question. I mean, I mean interesting just talking about office space and office supplies and chairs and, you know, um, these are things we forget about, right? True. So the answer is again, it depends because <laughs> it's going to depend on how much do you need this fractional controller, CFO, bookkeeper, you know, outsourced person, how much do you, how much time do you need? Um, different, Companies bill different ways. Some bill on a flat fee, some bill on an hourly basis. We bill on an hourly basis because we want to only bill for time that we're actually spending. We find that it's it's actually more beneficial for the client as opposed to this is the flat fee. And then, you know, we can kind of skirt around not doing different things because we're still getting this flat fee. So we don't do that. However, there are other things to think about when it comes to talking cost savings, turnover. We all know working in any business that turnover is more expensive than retention. When you're working with an outsourced firm, you don't have to worry about that turnover. The firm worries about it, right? So what we do is we always have a client manager and an associate or a staff account on the account. So there's always more than one person that understands the account. And then if there is any turnover, let's say our associate won the lottery, moved to the Cayman Islands, never wants to work again, then we can just bring someone else in because we have systems and processes to make sure that that can go smoothly. Yeah, that is something I had not thought of. And uh, that's fascinating because um, I think in the, the current 
climate of labor, we are all freaked out about our labor and replacing everybody. And then, as we just said, you know, not five minutes ago, there's a real concern with the talent pool when it comes to finance, financial services. And so, yeah, um, that's a really interesting thing to be thinking about. When we talk about that hourly wage, um, I've got to believe that the hourly wage in major cities is also much higher, or I should say different, than in other parts of this country. Does that ever factor in for this remote you know, labor uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, we'll have different rates for different markets, depending on what that market's, you know, going rate, what makes sense for different markets around the country, for sure. Um, but when we're working, it's more, you're not only working with one individual, you're working with an entire firm as well. So that's the other piece of the potential cost savings. When you hire one person, you get that one person's brain, right? <laughs> We only have one brain and we only have the amount of experience that we bring with our brain. Yeah. That's just life. Yeah. However, when you're working with a firm, you have the entire firm's collaborate brain. And sometimes that can save money because instead of having to maybe reach out to your tax accountant or reach out to your, your auditor or reach out to some other um, advisor, sometimes you can glean from the firm's collective brain Mm -hmm. to get to where you're going, even if that one person doesn't know, because they haven't had the experience yet for this specific niche of item, right? So there's some savings in that, both time and potentially monetary, depending on how many consultants you would have to bring in to ask the question and get them up to speed on what your situation is. Yeah, that's a that's a super interesting observation because, I mean, in our nonprofit journey, it's never the same. No two days are ever the same. No two grants are ever the same. And you get these wackadoo things that happen. And I like what you said. I like that there's that opportunity to get the right answer from the right resource quickly, as opposed to be laboring, you know, the process. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a super interesting thing. Well, so far, so very, very good. I'm very impressed. You know, this is a, like we literally threw you in front of the bus, hopefully not under the bus. <laughs> Let's go to one of our last questions because uh, our time is short today. When vetting a bookkeeper or a member of our financial team, our HR department does a series of background checks. How do we do this with a contracted financial firm? Is it even possible? We are always concerned about protecting ourselves from fraud loss. That is a great question. And yeah. one that I have not thought of before. Actually, I've had a couple of clients talk to me about this. So we do extensive, I mean, extensive, Julia, background checks. We, we double check their degree. We double check credit. We double check, of course, criminal background. Um, we double check everything that you can think of references and all of the bit. So when I'm talking to a client, we've already kind of done that for the client. Um, okay. However, it's a. I would think that the client could also ask for maybe um, information about that potentially for, but we wouldn't, we don't hire anyone that has any issues. Mm -hmm. Zero. Right. Issues. So in, in essence, you've taken on that liability as Correct. the contractor too, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's part of, you know, an engagement letter with a contractor is there's, you know, shared liability with certain things, but also it's important, whichever contractor you're working with to make sure you do have those separation of duties, right? Your contractor should not be the one writing the check. They're not a signer on your bank account. So they shouldn't be pushing the button to pay your bills. Someone else should be pushing that button. And so that's just kind of a conversation to have with your contractor and your board. What do you, feel comfortable with that the contractor is going to take care of and what should the organization take care of internally mm -hmm. or the board, you know, governance piece as well. Right. Well, and I got to believe that that dovetails into a lot of other things like um, what is your quote unquote drawer limit for signing contracts? And that's everything from uh, renting office equipment, to signing a lease, to engaging in a contract with um, a service provider, 
or a funder, you know, an MOU, a memo of understanding. I mean, there are a lot of things in the nonprofit sector that we engage in um, in a contractual basis, right? And, exactly. and organizations need to have set that as it's an old banking term, but the drawer limit, what what's that amount that's going to be allowed before it has to have some oversight? Right, exactly. And, you know, typically you know, we don't sign any contracts for our clients. Uh, sure. We work with our clients and we can help them review it and analyze and kind of decide if it's a good move for them. But we're not going to sign on their behalf because Ultimately, it's our job to educate the client on what they're what they're deciding. And then the client gets to decide, right? The board potentially gets to decide. Are you signing a lease? Is that part of your bylaws that your board needs to sign off on any lease contracts or maybe it's a, a building contract or whatever it may be? Every organization has to decide. Like you said, I like that the drawer limit. Yeah, I mean, I'm dating myself because <laughs> that is an old, you know, banking thing. But it's like you could go up to a certain amount, and then once it goes over that amount, it has to go to the next level. And you know, exactly. because you don't want to have your your executive director getting everything, you know, a hundred dollars and below approved. I mean, you, you've got to have some trust there and some efficiency, but. Wow, this has been really interesting. And and I knew Deanna Peterson, you were the perfect person for this amazing uh, conversation today. And it has been an amazing conversation all week. Uh, we have had really interesting, interesting um, chats with folks, all different types of people from your part-time controller, experts that have come in and talked to us about tech is a financial tool, which Deanna kind of you know, reinforced with a lot of the things that you talked about today. Um, we talked about stopping the stress of prepping for an audit and what that looks like. Financial best practices, like what are the modern best practices that we need to be thinking about? And then nonprofit budgeting, um, how we got to flip that script and make it more positive and more engaging and not just such a, oh, uh, I'm do I hate doing this, right? Um, because that's that's never a good approach to take, it's right? All um, about planning. It's it's it goes in line with your strategic plan. Budgeting a hundred percent goes in line with it. Not, the, eh, I know yeah. budgeting's not a it's it's not a four letter word, but a lot of people think it is. <laughs> I love it. I think that's great. Well, you know, it's one of those things because um, if you don't pay attention to it, it causes problems down the road. And if you go into it with a negative mindset and, a, you know, a dread, then you're not really helping yourself or anybody out there. I mean, it just it kind of as a self-fulfilled prophecy, I think, if it's, you know, negative all the way around. So but what has not been negative is your time on the nonprofit show with your part-time controller nonprofit power week. It's really been a lot of fun, Deanna, to reconnect with you um, in this way. We've had you on the show before, but um, it's, this has been a lot of fun. Deanna Peterson, director of your part-time controller. You can learn more about Deanna and our team at YPTC.com. Again, that's YPTC.com, your part-time controller. Deanna, thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. It's a pleasure. I'm always excited to be on the show. Thank you. Well, we're excited to have you here. And now that we know, we can like throw these throw questions. Throw them at me. <laughs> We love that. You're like, you're the rock star. We're going to start doing that more often to you. Hey, another rock star group we have are, are our presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. As we have shared uh, today that De Deanna is part of that um, illustrious team. These are the folks that have been with us for this whole week as we have shared Nonprofit Power Week. We don't do this very often. We only do it a couple times a year with thought leaders. And then we take our viewers through this deep dive about a specific subject. And uh, so it's been quite a week and a lot of fun, Deanna. Thank you Lots for being of finance. <laughs> Lots of finance. You know what? I think, and, and not to just be, you know, waving the, the banner, but I think that the organizations, and I get to witness a, a lot, I get to see a lot, but the ones that pay attention to this 
are the ones that are successful, no mm -hmm. matter their, you know, their mission, their vision or their values, the ones that drill down on this, they're the ones that are successful. And, um, and so it really is something that we need to be thinking about all the time. So thank you for bringing it to us today. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, everybody. We win, we end each and every episode with this um, mantra, I guess. And it's been quite a week with uh, your part-time controller. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.